Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here after an exciting day yesterday. Um, I was really struck by how so many people yesterday talked about the fears around AI, particularly Yuval calling it alien intelligence. And at the same time, I was also struck by all the positive energy and how many people are working on positive solutions to make the world a better place through AI. Our speaker being one of them through all the deep collaboration that you're doing around the world. And today, I'm especially happy to have this discussion with my friend, Megan Smith, the one and only. So I was trying to recall the first time that I met Megan, and neither of us could remember. We thought it was either while she was helping a young activist in Pakistan um, escape the Taliban and come to safety in the United States, or through her work as the co-founder uh, of the Malala Fund, or at the Solutions Summit at the UN, which you co-hosted to help find innovative solutions around the world to advance the sustainable development goals, or at MIT, where you sit on the board of the university. But as I thought about where and how I met Megan, it struck me, uh, I, I realized the breadth and the depth and the compassion of this woman to help, to serve, to innovate, to scale, to collaborate, to include. This woman is a force to be reckoned with. She was the third chief technology officer of the United States and assistant to President Obama. She played a pivotal role in designing the early stages of smartphone technologies at General Magic, um, spent over a decade at Google, and rumor has it that she once single-handedly debugged the entire internet while sipping on a cup of coffee. That is not true. <laughs> I have five sources for I that. I know, it's like <laughs> chat GPT hallucination. Yeah, yeah, and then today she's the CEO and founder of Shift7, which is a company that focuses on addressing systemic, social, environmental, and economic problems. So, Megan, you've had this illustrious career. You've helped solve some big problems. What is it today that gets you out of bed? What are you passionate about? Thanks, Ruma. It's great to be here. It's great to be with all of you. And uh, I, I think um, it's really all everybody, like all of you. Like what gets me out of bed is the talent. You know, there's there's this movie, The Sixth Sense. To, you know, the kid sees dead people. I see talent. And I think um, one of the biggest challenges we have are that you know I'm a card carrying optimist, uh, but we have daunting challenges. You know, climate, sc the scary aspects of AI that's coming at us. It, it already is discriminating, it already is doing face recognition, people are going to jail, like there's sort of this theory that, um, oh, it could be bad, it's very bad right now, as well as very good. Look at the amazing things that we're doing around health, around productivity, around this self-driving cars, these other ideas, but at the same time, you know, it's very dangerous also currently. If you haven't had a chance to watch the TED Talk from Kathy O'Neill about her book, Weapons of Mass Destruction, it's one of the greatest things to watch. Um, and so I worry about these things, and that does get me out of bed, right? And uh, I even brought um, Joy Bua Lamwini's book, uh, because I want people to know this will be out on Halloween. It's called Unmasking AI. You know, can we see this? So Joy was a student at the Media Lab, where I'm an advisor, and I was a student years ago. Um, and she was trying to do some work with uh, uh, some face recognition, you know, kind of early, before Snapchat had the face, you know, you could be, your, be a pet or be Serena or be whoever, she was trying to create that for a class, and the face recognition wouldn't see her. And so she got her roommate to sit down, can you see what's going on, and it saw her. So when she puts the white mask, it can see her, but with her darker skin, it doesn't see her. So the racist, te you know, racist tech, racist camera, so just, this is real. And so the first thing I want us to like notice is that we really do already have the problems. We were just at a conference in Venice, um, uh, both the awards that Diane von Furstenberg does, like a Nobel Prize for Women, amazing, threaded with the misinformation conference with Vital Voices, where I'm on the board. One of the leaders from Africa, a uh, parliamentarian, was saying about 90% of the women parliamentarians in Africa have pulled themselves out of social media now, already happening because of the vicious attacks already coming against their families, deep fake porn. So some people are already suffering from, you know, bots and other things attacking them as well as humans and using these technologies. So what do we do, 
right? So what gets me out of bed is all of us are the only way to solve this. And the more we separate, okay, well, maybe, let's say artificial intelligence, right? Artificial is probably the realm of computer scientists and bio and others. But intelligence, you know, just like face recognition, if you have a face, you belong in the conversation. Everyone belongs in this. And so not leaving AI to one group who are excited about it without having all of us in on the game and elevating these problems that already exist for design right now. Like, why aren't we running at the problem uh, for the parliamentarians as fast as we're running at other kinds of AI developments right now, right away, whether it's through civic tech in our governments or whether it's uh, through commercial tech, whether it's through philanthropic tech or whatever. So I'm interested in the collaboration we can do to actually really solve these things. And we cannot do it if we don't do it in a cross-pollinated, collaborative way with multiple uh, skill sets at the table because the problems are just too hard for any particular sector or any particular person. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, this conference, Megan, is about getting the next 10 years right. What does that mean? What does getting it right mean to you, particularly in terms of what you've just described, leaving AI to just one group and being more inclusive? And, you know, for what, how, would, how would getting it right mean to you? Um, the president's science advisor, Vannevar Bush, who was science advisor to Franklin Roosevelt, when Churchill, you know, everybody, the meetings at Bletchley Park are coming out during that time. After the, he was responsible for supporting and aggregating uh, with the UK and with others, um, you know, what became radar and jet engines, all this work that happened. Um, after the war, he wrote an amazing piece called Endless Frontiers. And I was recently looking at it, and if you get a hold of it down on around page 16, it says science and jobs. And what I love is he says, it's a little US centric because he's writing for the US gov government. He says, uh, you know, after the war, we should have a job for every person and increase the quality of life of everyone. And then he says, we can only do that, only with the full, full creativity of the American people. So he didn't say with some of the American people, with the Silicon Valley people, with the probably at that time Motor City, Detroit people, you know, yeah. wherever the center is, Austin, Boston, 70% of venture capital money in the US, for example, uh, like here in, in any country it centers, is Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston. Yeah. What about all the other people? So what's exciting is you can actually find all those people. You just have to ask. You have to do the work. For the people who have less visibility, less treasure, and less network, you can find them. We were doing that through UN Solution Summit and a, me and a message yeah. which we can describe. I call it Scout and Scale. Yeah. So tell us more. You're talking about this concept of full creativity. Yeah. What would we have to do in order to achieve that? You really have to sort of open up our networks. It, it's interesting because we're connected at the speed of light right, yeah. with the internet, but we use it for some things and not others. And so can we, one of my favorite things, if you look at, say, the Google developer groups, which is like tech meetups all over the world, in every city, Boise, Idaho has 15 tech meetups. One of them has 800 people in it. Most people in Boise don't know that. That's probably true of Manchester. It's probably true everywhere in the world, whether you're in Lagos, in Nigeria, whether you're, you know, in, in Central Asia, there's all these people, but it's like a Wakanda MacGyver yeah. set of people. And then there's all the other people who are also equally genius and interested in other topics and other things. Do so you think of it like an orchestra? Like these people are playing the strings and the, the brass and these people are playing the percussion, you know, and the woodwinds. How about we play the whole orchestra on the hardest problems and cross pollinate? It's one of the things the president was doing with us. He, you know, I, I didn't expect to go to government and I really encourage everyone in, in, in this room and listening, government is only who shows up, and that's all it is. So if you want your country to be strong in its government, you need to bring your skills. So we need our lawyers to rotate, we need our technologists to rotate, we need our management people. So having everyone come in, it can be a tour service, like sometimes people are saying, well, the tech people, you know, they're paid differently. You can, you can have a different paycheck for a little while. We brought hundreds of Americans uh, with president into government for the United States Digital Service, which is based on the uh, UK uh, Government Digital Service, Presidential Innovation Fellows. These are a one-year service job where you're front-end, back-end, data science. These people, but you're working right with the secretary of one of the agencies uh, and their team, and you're, you're getting this skill set yeah. into the room together with the other skill sets. These problems are too hard. And so we need to cross-pollinate 
um, in our governments, in our companies, in our philanthropy, you know, in our nonprofits, in our, com in a way, think of it like community organizing yeah. innovation. So you talk about this concept of cross-pollination a lot. Can you give us an example of what that looks like, especially as it relates to civic tech? Yeah, so uh, many examples. One of them would be the uh, president was working on uh, and pushing on criminal justice reform, urgent issue all around the world and all around in our country. So what we did was we created a, a cap We looked and saw that Dallas was already doing open data, use of force data, open, you know, all different kinds of data sets around policing and that. And so could we bring other cities together? So we had Dallas and others present to a set of cities who were interested, and they began to open up data sets. And pretty soon, going from a few to 10 to 20, and eventually 120 jurisdictions who were opening their data, uh, open systems, open source, we know is really effective. And um, one of my favorite photos of, uh, is of a uh, 10th grader in New Orleans teaching the police chief how to code. And out of the New Orleans team, Operation Spark, they were writing apps and other things to really you know, you need to green light, you know, or sunlight, sorry, sunlight problems, right? So to see what was going on so we could get in and solve some of the harder societal problems that were going on and the discrimination that was going on. And it really helped a lot. Were there a lot of lessons learned there? Yes. And one of the things I find in general is that there's always someone somewhere who's fixing something. And so if you have a hard problem, like some of the problems we're talking on stage about AI and uh, and, and uh, safety and control and these things, instead of looking down or making a small group and writing, you know, starting to design, look up and say, I wonder who is already solving. You know, I pulled out, I printed this out. This is obviously an eye chart. I'm not going to make you look at it. But uh, this is a list of potential harms and, and, uh, and automated decision making, right? And it's from 2017, individual harms around loss of opportunity, economic loss, social deterrence, um, loss of liberty, collective harms. And then, you know, page two has a list of mitigations uh, and things you can actually do. So if you go find things like this, there's a new blueprint mm -hmm. um, for an AI Bill of Rights that the White House has come out with um, that looks at, uh, you know, sort of notice and explanation. It looks at human alternatives. It looks at fallback. It looks at algorithmic discrimination policies. We have laws, you know, data privacy. We already have people who are very talented, like Joy and uh, Kathy O'Neill, people in this country. There's a Rolling Stone piece right now that uh, has a photograph of all these incredible AI inventors and creative thinkers, and it says, why is no one listening to this women? And in fact, these are the canon of solving some of these problems, and they're all young women of color. Let's get them into our room. So again, scout and scale, build communities of practice like guilds. Yeah. You know, we have the idea here in Europe of guilds. So let's have some of that thinking. Uh, for example, there's a meeting coming up at Bletchley Park. So before that meeting, why not organize a bunch of town halls and uh, use your universities, use your current space, and everybody get together and start working on the problems and making suggestions, take some of this structure of topics, dive into what people have, expand on it, open it up. Um, the best ideas, as Roald Dahl says, are often hidden in the uh, most unexpected places. And so get people involved and then have the, the government leadership have that input as they're making decisions. So you're talking about government leadership. What does that look like? What should every country have a CTO? Yeah, every country should have all the different skills, like the whole orchestra. So you, you typically would say, like if you looked at a resume, yeah. from somebody from the legal profession, they would have clerked or often did, done judicial thing in the government and they would have commercial and different things. But on the tech resumes, of course, every government has amazing technology. We in the US, we have NASA, we have Department of Energy, we have the IT teams, we have defense. But there's not that senior technical person in most governments that's technical. A lot of times there's a person in charge of technology that's not technical. But you want a surgeon general, right? You want uh, your, your person who is, you know, you wouldn't, you want someone who's medical to be the med an actual doctor, right, who studied right. medicine to be in there. And it doesn't mean they know more than other people, other tech people, we all can be quite arrogant and explain people, right? But uh, y you want them in there because like the CTO job I had, it's really a plus one job. It's, hey, what are you doing? How can I, 
oh, that's a beautiful car. Let me help you pump up the tires and add some jet fuel. You know, they already, they know what they're doing. These are expert people. Yeah. And one of my goals right now is shift seven, which means, and if you type it in myself, it's just we're on boards and others is really a stay where tech people are rare because there's tons of us in tech, but a lot of us are not in these other places where colleagues are genius and they just are moving a little slower yes. because they don't have the power tools that we have that we can bring to them and we can listen to them and add our skills as we know what they're trying to achieve and use their and leverage their genius. So I want to build on that. When you were the chief technology officer of the United States, that obviously is a position of tremendous power and influence. And at that time, I think governments were really trying to understand how can we leverage technology for government services. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, I think there's a shift towards more people's, you know, are asking governments to do more work around governance. How would you, if you were CTO today, address some of these big issues? What advice would you give CTOs in, in other countries to deal with some of the skepticism that exists? You know, the thing that I, the methods I use, we posted a blog at the end called Try This at Home, and it lists all the stuff that already exists uh, that people are doing somewhere. And I put some methods at the end, and really this idea of scout and scale, look for who's already doing things, get them in a room, create communities of practice, let them speak um, to share what they're already doing, and then you can iterate, you can do... Uh, like improv brainstorming. So if you hear from somebody, uh, then the, the group of us can then do what I call two-thirds yes and. How can we help this person? Partnerships, innovation, funding, et cetera, policy. And then one-third yes but, some critique. And then accelerate the doers. The more surface area, like venture capital, yeah. they don't make the companies, the, the founders do, right? Yeah. The more founder type innovator teams that we can find. And at the United Nations, um, we collaborated with them right after the sustainable development goals, these uh, global goals were launched, to just put out an all call on the internet, social storm, and say, who's already fixing these? Yeah. Right? And we got, you know, we did it each year at UNGA, and, you know, right after the ratification by the countries in 2015, one hour later, crowdsourced through the internet, 14 entrepreneurs took the stage, Totally gender balanced, race balanced, geo balanced, topic balanced, not a biased group that has more of the treasure and the voice and the visibility, everybody. And they had four, four minute TED like talks, and then we accelerated them, and then we celebrated. And we could see, hey, you know, there's, what, I think the submissions were 800 submissions from 130 countries in three weeks. So just be open for business. Yeah. You know, who's already fixing, and then put it together, open innovation from there, and story tell well. So you've talked about Scout Scale. Can you give us an example of how you found one of these solutions somewhere mm -hmm. and how, would, how, did, how is it scaled? You know, one I of think my... that's the fundamental issue that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah, you just, if you ask, I, we, I'm doing it all the time. Um, some of the, do you guys remember the Standing Rock protests when they were putting pipelines through uh, the Dakotas, uh, the Standing Rock communities, Native American leadership, indigenous leadership were pushing back on that choice and uh, beautifully and the world came together. Out of that, that group came to MIT once. And so we thought of a way through MIT Solve, which is a program like this, it's based on Solve4x and, and Davos-like meetings. We just asked who's already fixing things. And so um, that year we had uh, six genius leaders, innovators, just like our Soka Valley colleagues. They were from reservations or from the native communities. And now it's expanded. We have 36, eight a year, um, added Canada this year. So wow. how, you find people who are in unexpected places. Who, humans are amazing. You know, and if, in the age of AI, human intelligence is still the uncharted area. You know, there's a group called the Hokalea, uh, sailing with no instruments, like Moana, if you've seen that movie a billion times with your child. Um, there's people who can sail around this planet. Imagine the group in the front row here, us on a sailing vessel in the middle of the Pacific. Do we know where to go? They do. And they sailed around the world. So how can you, how can you realize that AI is really aggregated yeah. intelligence right now? In some ways, the way, by the way, I would note that when we were all in elementary school, we used sourcing. And a lot of the AI technologies kind of crawl and kind of like a great heist of human intellectual property. Uh, and, and in some ways, you know, the writer strike speaks to this, like 
what is the plan for giving credit to everybody and giving value back to everybody and not running through only a capitalist model? Really important. What are some of the AI work that's happening now that's exciting you the most? I think the healthcare stuff is some of the most exciting. I'm, I'm terrified of the policing and, uh, and surveillance parts of this, and I think that we have laws and we need to get ahead of applying those laws and making sure the, the students in our research universities and those who are working on AI are aware and have mitigation strategies that are already available to them, but that it's part of the core 101 course, not a side hustle ethics course yeah. that's like not like right into the curriculum. Um, and that's something that's beginning now and we need to accelerate that and require it. Part of regulation can be inclusion. Um, the things that I love doing computer science for all, which was a program where we just looked and saw which fact, which teachers in our country were already teaching yeah. CS and making it sort of hands-on and fun and inclusive. And where was the gender balance already existing and racial balance? And where were the kids excited? Let's accelerate those programs, uh, working with the NSF and others, and have more people see that. And the other thing I brought is just uh, the Grace Hopper celebration is about, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I always have stuff. Um, but they're about to meet and, uh, you know, lots of kids are watching Disney. And I saw this bag at the celebration last year. And, you know, here's Minnie Mouse. Look what she's holding, right? So why don't we get to see imagery, inclusive imagery on TV? You know, maybe she should be the person, maybe she's Ada Lovelace modern, right? Here in this country, at the time of Darwin, uh, Ada Lovelace, just near here, invented the first algorithm and thought of the idea of general programmability. And she said, I think we can figure out the mass of the cerebrum like we figured out the mass of, of astronomy and the planets. I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus, quantum, a calculus of the internet, of, 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 the, uh, of humanity, so of, a calculus of the nervous system. And so Ada, no one knows that a woman invented algorithms. Yeah. We did the Google Doodle, she was 20 hours rising worldwide. Uh, <laughs> but we need to know, we need to know as we meet at Bletchley Park that the Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Princess of Wales, the grandmother and great aunt were code breakers at Bletchley Park, Wow! right? Should... We need to know that it was two thirds women. I walked in the Oval Office and uh, Prince William had just left uh, the office meeting with President Obama. And I said, sir, what we're about to do is related to the prince, and he said, how's that? And I said, you know, Kate's grandmother, great aunt, we're co-breakers at Bletchley Park. He said, I just saw the movie, Imitation Game. And uh, I said, yes, Turing and Joan Clark, real people. I said, but two thirds of the people at Bletchley, I've met some of them in their 90s, uh, were women. He said, the movie doesn't show that. And I said, yes, sir, it's hurting the economy. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to know that everyone belongs and that the topics of interest to everyone are relevant yeah. for tech. Yeah, it's important so, to be inclusive. All in. So tell me, we've got about two and a half minutes left. We have this incredible audience. What challenge would you give this audience? What do you want to leave them with? Yeah, I think um, open up the conversation and look around and find, you know, share with each other things you see that are already promising or working. We have really hard problems and we have to move faster. And the surface area out there, if more people who are doing things well can get more help, get you on their team, um, I think we, we can really solve a lot. And remember that gender balance, race balance, geo balance, all this stuff matters a lot. There are people all over the world, not just in the places that are easy for us to find each other. We're in separated networks. So collaborate, cross-pollinate. The second thing I would add is, um, you know, find the hidden figures in history and current and really lift them up. Um, make sure they're in, uh, you know, if you see somebody not being heard in a meeting, you know, ask them to say that again. You know, there's a lot of bias and discrimination in how we as humans move. And so we will experience that. Do something about it. Um, bring young people in. Make it active. Like, if you're going to the, gonna have this meeting at Bletchley, let's have some town halls. We did that for AI with the president. We had town halls for AI at uh, University of Washington on, safe, on uh, law and policy open um, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh on safety and control with NYU on downward pressure on jobs. Just open it up and invite people and find a way to do that. So those are my, my main things. And then serve your country and government. You don't have to go forever, 
but the more talent that flows through our government. And also, if you're in government, let people in. Let the technical people in. It's not typical in most meetings, and yet we need, we need them in the meeting. And, uh, you know, they'll listen and they'll help you. And if you had one word to describe how you're feeling about where the po being a techno-optimist, hmm. it doesn't have to be a word, it can be a sentence. What would you leave this audience with? I think we have the possibility for sustainable abundance if we include everyone in the design seat with each other, not... There's a thing called nothing about us without us, which is Jimenez Principles Environmental Justice. Include everyone. One of my favorite colleagues is an indigenous guy, uh, Ben Juarez, who's from the Amazon. Yeah. And he's making floating fab maker spaces in the Amazon. Like, why aren't the people there in on the Moderna vaccine? Like, let's co-create and let's think about how to have a sustainable, healthy world, a thriving world where everything, animals, us, trees, and the people are all thriving and not super imbalanced, which is what we're doing right now. And you have to proactively do it. And you have to prioritize these things just as much as your, ma your main agenda. Prioritize equality now, and you'll be shocked how fast we can uh, include everyone and solve things and have a better world. Oh, thank you, Megan. So we've learned a lot today by this discussion. Design AI for inclusivity, scout and scale, create communities of practice, acknowledge women in tech history, and bring young people into the fold. And what was that last quote you just said? We're all... Just that, that we, you know, that the, that the more we include each other, the more um, we can have the abundance and the sustainability that we need. Yes, the full creativity. Yes. yes. Full so creativity. please join me in thanking Megan Smith for this wonderful discussion. Thank you.